welcome your host, Steve Buss, and we're certainly glad that you could join us and uh, take some time out of your busy schedule to uh, listen in on Warbirds tonight. We're going to be talking uh, with the Brad Pilgrim, who is our resident historian for the CAF, and we're going to explore the 1970s, the early part of the 1970s in CAF history. So uh, sit back, relax, and if you have any questions at any time, just type those into the chat box, and uh, we'll uh, try to get them answered either during the presentation or we'll save time at the end uh, to answer any questions uh, you may have. By the way, the uh, webinar series is made possible by the CAF. If you'd like to support our mission, just uh, go to our website, commemorativeairforce.org, and you can donate, or even better, join us and uh, become a part of the Commemorative Air Force. And again, joining us uh, tonight, Brad Pilgrim. Brad, good to have you uh, back on the, sh on the show, and uh, let's talk about the 70s. Thank you, Steve. Glad to be here. Um, the 70s was probably when the CAF really became into what you'd call a professional warbird organization. Um, because at the time they were still, you know, there were, there were various, uh, you know, individual warbird owners around the country or whatever, but for the most part, the CAF was the people who were going out and going to air shows and, and doing it in an organized fashion. And, uh, you know, in the 60s, 50, late 50s and early to mid 60s, we pretty much did, you know, shows within the local area and stuff like that. And, you know, they they expanded out to Ohio one time prior to that. But for the most part, they stayed in Texas. Well, by the time the 70s rolled around, the CAF was starting to get known and starting to be taken a little, taken a little bit more seriously, but also taking the business a little bit more seriously. Um, that's when they, you know, 1970s, when they started painting airplanes back in authentic colors. You know, originally, most of the airplanes were painted in the red, white, and blue. Uh, scheme that you know the cf house colors and uh around 1970 they started they started repainting airplanes and making them you know look a little bit more authentic um texas raiders right there in 1970s when they did the paint job on it and when they came to trying to figure out what b-17 to to represent the short story is they got a hold of uh general lemay curtis lemay and said we would like a suggestion and, and he came up with the 305th because there was only a couple of bomb units that had uh i think the story was there's only a couple of that had had pretty much survived the war with the best record and i don't remember the exact details of it but he suggested the 305th colors and that's where that paint scheme came from the texas raiders paint scheme came up uh, our name texas raiders came up separately from that um that's a picture of it uh this picture's from later on but this is is uh you know texas raiders and and uh fifi and you can tell that's taken from diamond lil because you can see the oil cooler hanging down right there but uh that's this is really the first bomber that we had that was painted in authentic colors and uh, it's what people refer to as a splotchy paint scheme and at the time the airplane was still just uh you know it wasn't set up as a bomber it had a big cargo door on the side it was missing some of the waste windows and uh you know the floor was raised and everything for photo, photo recon work but it was the first b-17 to really be in the air show business and the first one specifically preserved for that purpose and so texas raiders by this time was getting to be a very well-known airplane because it was the only b-17 flying around the country doing air shows so but that was the original paint scheme and that stayed on for a few years i think 1978 or 79 is when they went to the familiar green and gray paint scheme that we have on the airplane well and it's as you mentioned the uh the cargo door uh, mm -hmm. obviously right down here and no waste guns uh, yep. on either side so uh, yep. but uh, and all the turrets have been removed and skinned over and and uh, even in that picture you can see there's not even uh, windows in the tail gun that was still fiberglassed over at that point but uh, and the radio room floor was raised up it was a totally different setup in the floor in Bombay so that they could put cameras in it and everything it took a lot of work and they didn't they didn't actually get it back into original combat shape until you know 20 years after this picture was made it was it was work a little at a time because they had to fly the airplane to make money with it and and keep it going and so the the cosmetics on the inside had to take a, a back seat for a long time but it's it, it it's turned into a just absolutely gorgeous and really really authentic airplane today and gulf coast wing does an amazing job with it well with the uh the b-17 uh it like many of its its counterparts uh did a lot of aerial mapping and cargo flying which is why the the uh the floor was was redone in in so many of the b-17s that uh it, today on the on the warbird circuit yeah, look very authentic but 20 even yeah. 20 years ago uh they were uh the pretty rough shape inside and then part of what makes old airplanes like this so hard to restore for authentic you know totally authentic purposes 
is like in the case of B-17s, you know, there were a lot of them used for fire bombers in the, in the 50s and 60s and even up in the 70s. And uh, the last one retired, I think, in like 81 or 82 or something like that. And uh, every TBMs were the same way. You know, they took all the original military equipment off and threw it away because it was extra weight. They didn't, you know, they, they didn't need all that kind of stuff. And it didn't occur to anybody that somebody would, would want to buy a TBM and put the ball turret, you know, back in the back or the, the belly turret on a TBM. I heard one time that when they made the uh, Tora 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 movie, they wanted the B-17s to have belly turrets on. Well, they didn't have it. And so they went to a scrap yard and bought these B-17 belly turrets for $50 a piece still in the box. And they just took a cutting torch and cut them off even and just bolted them, riveted them to the bottom of the airplane. Well, those things are probably $25,000, $30,000 a piece now. But at the time, they were 50 bucks a piece. But no one cared about the authentic stuff until, you know, the early 70s. Then it started becoming important again. Well, one of the uh, uh, counterparts on the other side of the uh, uh, of the war, air war, in uh, Europe especially, was, of course, the uh, ME-109. The 109, um, you know, the CF initially had four ME-109s that came over from the Battle of Britain movie. And uh, in 1970, a guy named Bob Griffin, and Bob comes up a lot in CF history. And he he's, uh, in a lot of ways, Bob Griffin would be very deserving of a, a show on his own because he is such an interesting, it was, unfortunately passed away, a very interesting individual and, and very, very, very important to the history of the CAF. And he'll be mentioned a few times tonight. But um, this 109 right here, this was the one, they were flying two of them for the most part. Two were kept for parts and two were flying. But they were still in the Battle of Britain movie paint. And in 1970, Bob Griffin sponsored this, this Messerschmitt, took it to his place in San Antonio, uh, went through it, had it you know fully restored for back in 1970, uh, really restored really nice and did a lot of work on it and then put this authentic paint scheme on it. And it it is very close to being the first CAF airplane that had an authentic paint job put on it. Diamond Lil had an authentic paint job around the same time, maybe just a little bit later, but it wasn't authentic for that model of airplane and, and the nose art was a, was a creation of somebody else. It wasn't an authentic nose art. This airplane, even though it's a Spanish Messerschmitt, that was an authentic paint job for a 109. And so this this airplane got a lot of uh, got a lot of use out of it. And uh, it's still around today. It was sold over the years. It, it you know, it wasn't flown a lot, had a couple of accidents and it wound up in England. And now it is either restored or is in the process of being restored with the German engine on it. That's it taxiing out at Air Show 72. Um, that's, or 71, I'm sorry, October of 71. And you see in the background, you see those white T-34 sitting there with the blue stripes. There was four of those T-34s, Ed Messix and Bob Griffin, and I can't remember, Glenn Barcott, and maybe one other person. There was four guys who had a formation T-34 team. And it was probably the very first formation T-34 team in the civilian world. And, you know, Lima Lima did it years later and everything. But these guys that were CAF Warbird pilots had their own T-34 thing. Bob Griffin, who paid for all this, he was a rocket fuel designer for NASA. And Bob was, was pretty much, from what I understand, credited with developing the fuel that got the Saturn V rockets in the space. And so that's where Bob's considerable financial ability came from. And uh, yeah, Bob is very generous with the CF. And like I said, his name will come up several times today. But that was the first airplane that he sponsored and painted and had redone. The Hellcat, uh, you know, the CF had two different Hellcats. The first one they got in the 60s, and it unfortunately had a belly landing and caught on fire and, and uh, was destroyed in the fire. We talked about that last time. Um, in 1972, this one showed up from Minnesota. And you can't really tell it in that picture, but it had been modified considerably for racing. Um, it had, you know, shortened wings and all this kind of stuff and really was not a very good airplane to be flying. But we flew it for years. And uh, this was the first paint scheme that it had when it arrived at the CAF. And then uh, shortly after that, it got repainted and then got repainted a couple more times over the years. But that, that showed up in 1972. That's the second paint job on it. And uh, John Callhouse from down in Corpus Christi was one of the sponsors of it. Reg Ursler, who famous for flying the Mustang gunfighter for years and years. He was one of the sponsors on it. 
Um, the airplane came from John Sandberg in Minneapolis, where he intended to use it as a racer, but never did. And uh, but that's the same Hellcat that we have today that's out with the SoCal wing. The TBM uh, that showed up in 1972 as well. And um, a guy named Dr. Wick here in Dallas was one of the sponsors of it. And then Ronnie Gardner, who was a CF Hall of Fame member, Ronnie became a sponsor of the airplane. And you, it was a Canadian airplane. You can see it doesn't have the turret on the back. And it was several years. It was well up until the 80s before they got the turret when it went to the Colorado wing, our Rocky Mountain wing in Colorado. But this, it flew in this paint scheme for years and years. and was really one of the very first TBMs that was operated as a warbird. It wasn't the first one restored in these, in, you know, in authentic colors, but it was one of the very first ones ever operated as warbird. That one we still have today and it's still at the Rocky Mountain wing. That's it right after, if you look right behind that antenna, you see that, that bubble in the plexiglass there on that second cockpit. That, from what I understand, is a Canadian mod for some kind of observation thing that they used to do. And so, you know, I don't think any TBM outside of a museum still has that. Uh, I'm sure that piece doesn't exist today, but if it did, that'd be one of those, you know, hard to find warbird parts I was talking about earlier that people would pay dearly to have nowadays. But now the airplane's got a, got a turret on it and everything like that, and it's, it's up, at the, up in Colorado and Grand Junction, and they, they still operate the airplane today. This brings up Bob Griffin again. In 1970, 1970, he bought the Helldiver and the Dauntless from Ed Maloney at the Plains of Fame Air Museum out there in Chino. And, and Ed, um, Ed's really the only part, Ed Maloney is the only guy who owns, who had a Warbird longer than the CF did. He bought a Mustang just about six months prior to the CF buying Red Nose. And so Ed Maloney, you know, he's, he passed away several years ago, but Ed Maloney is one of the godfathers of this business. But when he bought his Warbirds initially, he wasn't operating them. He was buying them for his collection, for his museum. The CAF was operating them. That's why we can say we were the first flying Warbird organization. But anyway, they had these airplanes down there in Chino and Bob Griffin bought them and uh, paid to have them restored. They were restored, but paid to have them, you know, annualed and got going again. And uh, a man named Bruno Granovsky, who lived in Dallas, he ran the the, uh, the DFW maintenance squadron. And Bruno had been a P-36 Hawk and P-40 uh, Warhawk mechanic in the Philippines and stuff like that in World War II. Uh, he was a grumpy old guy. Hey, oh, he was grumpy. I remember him when I was a little kid and he was just, he was just an old grump. But he knew airplanes. He knew how to work on them. And his name was on the P-40 for many years as the crew chief. But Bruno and another guy went out and got these two airplanes ready to fly. And uh, I can't remember who brought the Dauntless home, but Gerald Martin, who flew in the Battle of Britain movie and is a famous CF guy, Gerald Martin brought that thing, the Helldiver back. And I've got the original logbook for that airplane. But he flew it. They flew it, like Tess flew it twice around Chino and headed for Texas. And uh, this is what it looked like when they got it. And he landed it on a little bitty duster strip that he operated off in Hereford, Texas, up by Lubbock. And uh, depending on which version you read, he either fixed the generator and took it on down to Harlingen. But what Gerald told me one time, and someday I'll look in the logbook, but what Gerald told me was he landed the airplane there in Hereford, had a generator issue, was about scared to fly the airplane out of that little bitty duster strip, and he said, I kind of lost my nerve and waited around to see if somebody else would come get the airplane and take it rest of the way. But then they had a snowstorm and the airplane got buried in the snow and all that. So he ended up bringing it. So we, they, we bought them in 1970 or they were donated to us by Bob Griffin in 1970. But they didn't arrive in Harlingen until 71. Uh, the Helldiver, the West Texas Wing, still operates this airplane today. It's still the only flying Helldiver in the world uh, and has been for its entire life. And the, the Dauntless is with the Dixie Wing down in down in Georgia. I'm sorry, the uh, Atlanta squad, whatever it's called now, Air Base Atlanta. Air Base that's Georgia. It when, Air Base Georgia, that's it. Uh, this is it when it was painted in its original colors with the CAF. And it was in the markings of uh, Admiral Cousins, R.W. Cousins. And he flew into battle midway and several other things and was a famous Dauntless pilot. And I think in 72, they took this out to Norfolk, Virginia and loaded it up on the USS Lexington. And it was on display in the Lexington. It didn't fly off of it, but it was displayed there. 
Um, this is the Dauntless down in Harlingen, not long after it arrived. And the thing about this, and you, you talk to some of the people who were around the CF back in the early days, and they'll tell you this was another airplane. It was not the safest thing in the world. At one point, it didn't even have a seat in the back seat. It just, you sat in the floor and it just had a seatbelt. And you just wrapped the seatbelt around your arms and held on and prayed. And then they put the gunner's ring in it, but the gunner's ring wasn't the right one and it made the airplane tail heavy. But the airplane was moderately airworthy and was operated by the Corpus Christi guys for a long time. And uh, then it ended up with, with uh, out there in, in Georgia at the Peachtree City. And they went through it and did a lot of work to the airplane. And it is just absolutely gorgeous today. And it's that and the Hell Diver both are on the ride program. So I've ridden in both of them. And uh, I'm a B-29 guy, as everybody knows. But boy, if you have the ability to go take a, a Dauntless or a Hell Diver ride, I highly suggest it. Because it is really neat to do. And it's, it's hard to find an airplane much more historical than those two are. And when you're sitting in the back seat looking around, you know, with the guns in front of you and all that, and you think of what these people did in World War II, um, you know, fighting off the Japanese with this thing. What were they thinking? You know, I, I don't know how people had the nerve to do it. I'm glad they did. But it's, it's really neat to sit in that seat and try to imagine what it was really like. Uh, I wouldn't have wanted to do it in real, for real life. Yeah. Well, and, and this also brings up, uh, as we're talking about the Pacific, this is also about the time that uh, uh, Tora, 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 uh, came together and was it was organized and uh we were talking about this this shot before it's uh if you know anything about aviation photography and especially uh aviation photography in, in the 70s i mean things have come so far with the digital cameras and image stabilization and all that, that all the cool yeah. stuff that happens now and you can get great pictures almost anybody can but this particular right. picture really struck me uh not only because it's torah but also just the the composition and um i would love to know <laughs> who shot it and uh, what they were flying it you know that, that that's sort yeah of you know that's probably like a john tegler or, or or somebody like that who did a lot of shooting in the early 70s that's probably one of their shots i would think um you know these these airplanes were all modified t6s and bt13s that were used in the Tora Tora movie. And a guy in Tennessee named Gerald Weeks uh, wound up with a bunch of them and he donated six to the CAF. And I wanna say it was three zeros, two vowels and a K. I don't remember the exact makeup, but he donated six of them to the CAF. And somewhere I've got the original bills of sale for all those airplanes. And it's in an envelope that, that uh, Lloyd Nolan's handwriting, he's got very, Lloyd Nolan had very distinct handwriting. And on this envelope, it says Jap plane paperwork. And so I think that's kind of funny. But anyway, the CAF first got those in 1971. And the guys down in the Gulf Coast area, Gulf Coast Wing guys, which actually had just kind of formed at that point, uh, you know, Tommy Reedy and J.K. West and a couple other guys, they started getting these back into uh, good shape. But Tora Tora, the actual act that we know of today that, uh, you know, Mike Burke and Buddy Cooksey have been flying with since time began, and, uh, you know, one of the premier air show acts in the world, they did their very first air show as an organized Tora Tora group in 1972 with the Galveston Air Show. And, you know, they've been doing, they've been doing air shows for 50 years now. I think it's probably the oldest air show act that is still in existence today. And it's good. I've been watching them since I was a kid and it, it's still, even though I don't, I know they don't really get shot down. They don't really crash to me. It's just as fascinating now as it was when I was five. Yeah, it is. It is quite an aerial ballet. Uh, even even when you know that we'll, we'll call it the inside secrets of how it works, right. um, you still watching it as a spectator. It it is an amazing presentation. Those guys are good. I mean, the the, the people that fly, they're very strict about who they fly with. They're very picky about who they fly with, and it's not an easy group to get into. And uh, um, but my gosh, those guys are good. They they are just they're abs they're they're great. Their maintenance is great. Their mechanics are great. Everything about them. They're they're one of the greatest air show acts. I, I love watching them. Yeah. I love watching them. Well, the seventies also saw not only expansion in uh, the aircraft uh, that were uh, coming into the fleet, but also uh, a number of and you've mentioned several of them already. Some of the the wings that that start to spring up around the country. Yeah, um, you know, the CAF, it was never intended to extend beyond the Rio Grande Valley down there in Texas. That was, they just never thought about it, I don't guess. And uh, what they started finding out was, you know, like in Minnesota, there was a group of guys who who had another B-25. They, they, it wasn't a CF airplane. It was, it was operated by 
just a group. And that became the nucleus of the, you know, the Minnesota wing, which is still around today. Um, the Gulf Coast wing, the New Mexico wing, the, uh, there was another, one. I forgot what the other one was, but there was, there was like four or five wings that were established in 1971 and early 72. And they were the first wings outside of Texas. And it was kind of done almost as an experiment just to see, well, let's see if these people have the wherewithal to, to carry on as excited as they are here in the beginning. Let's see if they have the wherewithal to really keep this going. And they did. And the CAF found out, wow, this is a way to spread, to spread our, our message, to spread our, you know, it's like a television evangelist kind of thing. You know, we can get our word out and people will start supporting us and people will start, you know, coming to our air shows and all that and helping pay for this kind of activities. And, uh, you know, that's, that's kind of where the wings started. And those four or five initial wings, um, like the Minnesota wing, still around, Gulf Coast wing, still around, you know, New Mexico wing, it's not quite the same as it was, but some of the, you know, some of that group was around, but uh, that really is, the wings are what is, are what is responsible for the success of the CAF. You couldn't just do it if it was just local to Texas, as much as us right. Texans would like to think we could, <laughs> and as hard as we would try, you could not do this without the other groups and people like the Minnesota wing in particular and SoCal and all these and you know the Georgia folks there to just they take the message places that we just couldn't have done it from the Rio Grande Valley and uh they're they're the secret to the success at the end of the day I think well and it also uh, it not only uh, spreads the word uh, as you you said but it also uh spreads the airplanes across the, the country uh to yeah. give more people an opportunity to interact with the aircraft whether it's as a pilot maintenance um you know just basic things that that need to to happen to uh to keep an airplane flying you know fundraising and sweeping the hangar it's all, it's all part of the mission and uh, with having as many wings around the country uh it allows more folks to be uh, involved yeah, well, and and the other two of the other wings that formed at the same time were the headquarters wing, because headquarters it wasn't a wing; it was it was a it was a business office, and they happened to have a hangar there. But the headquarters wing they formed around that same time because it was the people who were operating the airplanes. And then the DFW wing did the same thing, and that directly led to um, I don't remember the year; I want to say seventy two or seventy three. Uh, Gary Levitz gave what at the time was the largest contribution ever to the CF. It totaled two hundred and twenty thousand dollars, which in those days was tall cotton, you know. And that was he was already involved with the CAF, but whenever they started the DFW wing and he lived here in Dallas, he's like, well, now they're serious about this. They're, they're serious. And so he donated a P38 in a in a in a Bearcat and then he gave him like $185,000 in cash and retired the bank notes on a lot of stuff. And he's kind of the guy who established the maintenance fund because the rest of his money was earmarked to go straight into the, the, the maintaining the airplanes because his thinking was we've already got all the airplanes we're going to get because by 1972, they had their core collection. We had, I think in 1970, 1972, we had 55 airplanes counting all the trainers and everything. And then the thought was, we'll never get any bigger than this. And so Gary Levitt's kind of led the charge on we need to really get these things in tip top shape. And so he made that contribution to help with that. And, uh, you know, that that kind of is where the flying and the maintaining business in the CF became two separate entities. And later on, like in 75 is when they really CF really had to change the way they did business. But 72 is when they started thinking, you know, or 71, actually where we're going to have to we're going to have to get serious about maintaining the airplanes because this is bigger than just us now this is right. countrywide um we've got a a question from uh, one of our viewers we're going to back up a little bit to the uh uh SBD um uh, do you have any other information on the airplane when the Corpus Christi wing uh had it no at the time um there was a John Culhouse was one of the guys who flew it a lot. And uh, there was another guy named Carl Wendell, who was, is, was I think they both passed on since then. They both were big in the operation of it. Um, the CF used it a whole lot, that and the Helldiver both for photo ships because they were fast enough to be photo ships and they had such great vision from the back. Uh, the Corpus Christi wing, they, main, they had a T6. And then later on in the 80s, they were heavily involved with the CF's original Japanese zero, authentic zero. 
but the the Dauntless is kind of what they formed around. And I don't know if the Corpus Christi Oilers, you know, that Troy and those guys do such a fantastic job with today. I don't know if those guys formed out of that or if they formed alongside it. I'm not really sure. But the the Corpus Christi wing was very important in the original, the early days of the CF in the early 70s, as they those people still are today. It's not quite the same involvement as it used to be. But uh, I think the airplane just got to be too much for them to maintain because by the late 80s, it was getting in pretty ratty shape. In fact, I think when it ended up going to Georgia, it had to be trucked out to Georgia because it was just in that bad of shape. And, and then that's where it got fully restored. And it wasn't that the, wasn't that the Corpus Christi people didn't try. It's just, you know, some people have, have the, the wherewithal to do it financially and otherwise. And sometimes a unit doesn't. And so it went somewhere else. But the Corpus Christi people were the ones who kept it flying for the first 15 years or so that the CF had it. And that's now the, uh, the what has evolved into the Maxine Flournoy uh, Third Coast Squadron. Yep. Yep. And the the uh, the um, oil detachment is now a detachment. They were a part of. Uh, yeah, they were part of the squadron. Right, his crew were part of the, the the squadron, but now they're they're their own detachment. So it's uh, kind of a step up for them, and and uh, kind of recognizing uh, the important uh, service that they provide to uh, air shows, uh, not only in, in Texas but kind of around the country. Don and Troy and all those guys with the with the the with the oilers, you're not going to find a harder working, more dedicated group in the CAF and those guys are people that are more of a pleasure to be around. There you go. Those those guys, they're great. They have their they own challenge the, coin. <laughs> they are they are some of the best ambassadors for the CAF that you'll ever find because everybody knows who they are and they are very good at spreading the message. And they perform a service that's a thankless service a lot of times. But believe me, that they're they're appreciated. People may not tell them, but those guys are amazing and we like so many other little small groups in the CF, that's one that we just, we don't know how lucky we are to have people that would do that. That is very true. Well, in the, uh, the early 70s, we also uh, see some of the Bell aircraft uh, coming online as well. Yeah, the, the P-39, the one that's Russian colors, that uh, Don Hull down in Sugarland, Texas, is the guy who restored that airplane. And it has a pretty interesting history about, uh, uh, maybe, it was, maybe it was initially acquired illegally from a training school that then sold it to someone else. But what happened was the airplane wound up in New Mexico during the war, wound up in New Mexico on a ferry flight, had an engine problem or engine failure or something, and just got left there. And so the town just took it. And we're talking like three or four years after the war, no one ever came and asked about it. And so the airplane got donated to a trade school and then you know they took it all apart, never put it back together. And then Don Hull there in Sugarland, he got it. and. He got sued by a guy who claimed back later and claimed he owned it, but Don won. And I've got a lot of that paperwork. It's pretty funny to read the court case. Two guys fighting over an airplane that they both claim they own, but it was stolen from somebody else to begin with. But he restored it and, and repainted it, and it went into these Russian colors. And uh, we still have that airplane today. The Syntex wing operates it. Um, the the P-63 there in the front, that is 191 Hotel. That's the one that's in Georgia today. That other P-63 or P-39 on the far side painted up in the P-400 early war colors, uh, that airplane actually never belonged to the CF. A lot of people did because it had CF painted on it and all that, but it belonged to Ed Messix and uh, Larry Irvine, and I think there was one other guy. And it was one of those that back in the 60s and 70s was very popular to operate them with the CAF and under the umbrella of the CF. And that airplane today is in the, the Kalamazoo Air Zoo. It's on static display and doesn't fly anymore. But that one was actually an air racer. That Myra Slovak raced that airplane at, at a couple of different races. And uh, it's it's a neat little machine. I hate that it's groundbound. I wish I wish they would fly it again. But uh, I don't I don't know that they ever will. Now, Transpo seventy two was really something that. What was happening was, you know, used to you had the Farnborough Air Show, the, uh, you know, the Berlin Air Show, the Paris Air Show. There was these big na you know, international aviation expositions. This is back in the days of the World's Fair and all that kind of stuff that, you know, that really doesn't happen anymore because of the advent of the Internet. You don't need to go places to see things. Um, in 1972, the, the, well, actually in 71, 
uh, Mendel Rivers, who is the chairman of the Armed Services Committee, he thought that the U.S. needed to have their own version of the Berlin Air Show or the Paris Air Show, and so he came up with the Transpo 72. And the, the Vietnam War was winding down at this point, and a lot of the aviation and, and uh, you know, uh, military weapons builders that were involved in aviation contracts and all that kind of stuff, those contracts were starting to dry up. And they started looking at other ways to make money. And a lot of them, because they're in aviation or whatever, they got just into general forms of transportation. And so this was thought up as a mass transportation show, is kind of what it was, a World's Fair of Transportation. And it just happened that airplanes was a big part of it. But it involved trains, it involved cars, it involved the first hovercrafts that were really, you know, practical. It was a monstrous thing. There ended up being one and a quarter million people come to that thing. And uh, it only happened one time. There was an air show every day and everything, but they only had it in 1972. Uh, because on the last day, there were three crashes during the air show, three fatalities. And the last day, the Thunderbirds had an accident in a F4. Um, engine engine failure of some sort and the guy punched out of the f4 and had a good ejection but unfortunately the plane crashed and exploded on the ground and he was sucked into the fireball and so this guy unfortunately died in front of everybody and that's why transpo there was no transpo 73 because they didn't want to have an air show portion this has all happened at the dulles international airport in dc and they didn't want to have another air show and have an accident there and so that's why it never happened again but the CAF were, this is one of the most instru you know, one of the most important happenings ever in the history of the CAF. And I, and it, I don't think people really realize it, but everyone that has ever looked at an old picture of a warbird from, from the seventies or a picture of the CAF from the seventies, you've seen pictures from Transpo and just didn't know it because they took 18 airplanes. What happened was in, in, in October of 71 at air show 71, and an uh, Air Force jet, like you know, a transport jet, came to the air show, and these four guys got off of it and said, we are here with the Department of Transportation and uh, the Energy Secretary and all this stuff, and we're here to watch y'all and see how y'all do y'all's air show, because if y'all are good enough, we want y'all to come perform at this big air show in, in D.C. And first, they were kind of worried about why are these people here? You know, we, we, we don't like the government coming to look and see what we're doing. And uh, they watched the show for over the, the three days or two days of the show and were highly impressed and, and sent an official invitation to the CAF to bring what they could. And they ended up taking 19 airplanes out there, actually 20 airplanes, but 19 of our airplanes. We Everything that the P-63 right here, uh, 191 Hotel, uh, it was specifically painted back in military colors, French military colors for this air show. Um, the P-40, the paint was redone on it so it would get there. The, the uh, all the airplanes were painted in military colors. And basically what they took up there, they took the B-29, the B-24, the B-25, the A-26 Invader, which that one was the first one we had and it has RGA painted on the side of it. And there's a picture that's pretty famous of it flying by the Pentagon. That was taken during Transpo 72. Uh, the Thunderbolt, the Wildcat, the TBM, the Helldiver and the Dauntless, the Mustang, the P-40, the P-63, Corsair, um, a Hudson bomber that we still had at the time, the Thunderbolt, the Messerschmitt, two P-38s, and something else. But there was there was 20 airplanes all together that went. And it was a 3,500 mile round trip for the CAF. And they took 110 people that were all handpicked and uh, they went up to DC and they flew two performances every, you know, for 10 days, that was 20 performances. And then at the end of the trip, they were asked to make this flight up the Potomac River. And that's where a lot of these famous pictures were taken. And they went down and started basically at Mount Vernon, George Washington's house. And they formed up and then came down to Potomac and flew past the Pentagon and all this other kind of stuff. And then they were invited to come make low passes down the runway and uh, there at Dulles. And that's back when the rules were not quite as tight as they are today. And so naturally, no one was going to say no to a, to a low pass. And so that's what they did. The only airplane they didn't fly in the Pentagon flyover was the Messerschmitt. They didn't think it was appropriate to have a you know a German airplane flying over the Pentagon and all. So they took all the Army and Navy airplanes. But this, 
like this picture right here, you can see the B-25 in the far corner. That's that's the one that the Minnesota wing operated at the time, privately owned, but it was called I See No Problem. Um, that airplane is still around today, belongs to a private owner out in California. Texas Raiders in the front and then the B-24, uh, Diamond Lil. And then you see the A-26 right there. Uh, that A-26, that one we had from 1970 until 1981. And it caught on fire. It had this, I think, what actually happened. I've never found out 100%, but it was getting ready to take off and had a fire in the engine. Like, I think the starter hung or something like that, and it caught on fire. And the fire department took forever to get out there, and the airplane burned down. And for several years, we had a lot of parts of it in the in the hangar there in Midland. But there was two A26s that we got in 1970. 1970. This is one of them, and then there was another one. The other one, the CAF sold because it was an on mark executive conversion. They sold it to somebody else who then in Dallas, who then sold it to someone else, and it wound up getting uh, uh, wound up getting caught carrying guns and, and drugs down into South America, and so that uh, that that's where that airplane wound up. But this one here burned up and doesn't exist anymore. But um, this is where the CAF really became known. This is when everybody heard the name CAF because this was a huge thing. This was on the, uh, you know, Walter Cronkite was talking about this at night on the news and, you know, the air show was huge. Bob Hoover flew in it and everything like that. But all the CAF airplanes were kind of the ones that, that claimed all the glory. They tried really hard to get Fifi uh, finished in time to go here, but they couldn't get, because Fifi had arrived in 71, we'll talk about that later. Um, this, this was in May of 70, uh, May and June of 72. They could have had Fifi up there, or would have made it, but the U.S. Air Force still wouldn't re remove the one-time flight clause, which we'll talk about later. But this is what made the CF famous. And in fact, you know, we talked last time about the history of the name Confederate Air Force and, and where it came from and all that. And when all this was planned, they sent out a letter from headquarters to the 110 people who were going to be involved in this. And I've got a copy of the letter where they said, you will not have a Confederate flag anywhere on your uniform. Because at this time, they still had the big embroidered Confederate battle flag and all that kind of stuff. They said, you can have Doe Squadron, you can have the word Confederate Air Force, but you cannot have a Confederate flag. They said, for the simple fact that that will not be understood by the world, and the world is going to see this. And, uh, you know, in 1975, that movie Ghost Squadron came out, or it was, it was a film, and then that's when Tennessee Ernie Ford sang that song, Ballad of the Ghost Squadron. The vast majority of that film was filmed at Transpo 72. And a lot of that footage was used by uh, a man named Earl Green is the one who made that movie. A lot of that footage was used in the nightly news broadcast. And, stuff. and this stuff went out over the wire services all over the world. So that picture's from later on because Fifi, that picture is actually from 75, I think, but because uh, Fifi's in it. But this is what made the CF famous. This is what got its, you know, a worldwide attention. And this is when we started having people in foreign countries asking about operating warbirds. And this, you know, they were already doing it, but this is when they wanted the CAF to start units in England and France and all this kind of stuff, which we ended up doing and still do today. But Transpo 72 was probably, other than Lloyd Nolan and those guys buying that first Mustang, Probably the biggest thing as far as making the CAF last that ever happened was Transpo 72, because that is when our name became nationally known. And that is when our presence became nationally known. And there was nobody else in the world that could compete with us with airplanes. Like I said, I think we had 55 airplanes at the time. And they did this entire trip with no major mechanical issues. They never missed a single performance. They did all this and with, you know, very little warning, quite honestly. They didn't have a lot of time to prepare for it. And it was probably the biggest thing the CAF ever did outside of the Valley or, or, or you know, Midland or something like that. It's very important in the history of the CAF. And it, it is amazing because there's, uh, until I got involved with, with CAF and started learning the history of the organization, I had no uh, uh, recollection of the Transpo 72 even happening. It, it was not something that anybody talked about or you knew about uh, yeah. un until we got into the CAF and, and started looking into the history and you realize that was a massive undertaking uh, yeah. uh, to put on a show of that size. Uh, well, it just, you just, know. you know, it's back in the days of the world's fairs and stuff like that. You know, it was, 
it was massive. You know, it was huge. And it wasn't just it wasn't just the CAF and it wasn't just aviation. It was every kind of transportation. But the CAF was the headliner of the entire thing. And there were other warbirds involved and all that kind of stuff. But as far as a group of here with this group from the south that preserves these airplanes or presents these airplanes, here they are introducing the CAF. And that's it's it's unbelievably important. One of the funny things is, is there's a picture, and I should have included it, and I, I didn't think about it until just now. There's a picture from that from Transpo 72 of a of a much younger Ted Kennedy, uh, Senator Kennedy, coming off the steps for Diamond Lil, and he's reading the the air show program, and he's talking to two CF people, and it, the caption on the back of the photo said, "Even famous people go unnoticed when they're standing around cool airplanes," and that was that was Ted Kennedy. I wish I'd have put that picture in here, but. So I don't know. He was probably nobody really back then, other than you know, former president's brother. But yeah. kind of funny to see his picture in there. Well, and and amazing too when you, you put this in a historical context. Um, and I know some of our audience is relatively new to the Warbird movement, and by relatively new, I mean the last 10, 15, 20 years. Uh, yeah. But really, uh, the Warbird movement it sort of, I mean, with the CAF starting, uh, but I mean, in sort of a, an aviation in the aviation world in the early, very early 60s. So this is 10 years after the Warbird movement is just st still in its infancy. Yeah. And, uh, and as you pointed out earlier, many of the airplanes were not done in authentic colors and they hadn't been restored right. inside and out. And right. this was really, uh, it was really at the, the very beginnings of, of uh, the Warbirds that, that we enjoy today. But uh, really what, what an opportunity for the CAF to, to kind of uh, show, show their stuff uh, as it were. And uh, really, as you mentioned, Brad, really get recognized not only nationally, but internationally. Yeah, well, and, and you know, this was only 27 years after World War II ended. And, you know, today we look at it as it's so far in the distance. You know, it's, you know, we're not long from 100 years since World War II ended, you know, in the grand scheme of things. This was only a quarter of a century after the war ended. And if you think about it at the time, these planes weren't flying around. There were no flying B-24s, you know, except for this one in the world. There wasn't 200 Mustangs. There was like 12, you know, and so... It 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 exposed it introduced the world to the warbird movement, and it just so happened the CAF was the focal point of it. And I think it's very responsible for the early success of the CAF because there was a massive increase in members and stuff after this because we we wrote on that we wrote on this publicity for years, you know. Well, speaking of the warbird movement, we can't uh, really discount this airplane. <laughs> As, yeah, that's, that's uh, what it has done, not only for Warbirds, but also for, for the CAF itself. So, yeah. Probably the biggest airplane the CAF ever owned, obviously, is the B-29. And the biggest project that they ever got involved in was the B-29. And this started in 1966, 64, actually. But, you know, Vic Agatha, when he joined the CAF, he said, we really need a B-29. I'm going to find us a B-29. And, you know, most people have known the story, and, and, and I've done presentations over it. A lot of other people have, too. What ended up happening was a man named Roger Baker found all these B-29s. There's 32 of them sitting there. Found them all in China Lake, California. The CF knew they were there, but hadn't had been told we couldn't get them. So we had looked at other ways of getting B-29s and finally settled on this and, and were able to get a hold of the right people. And Roger went out to China Lake, flew out there, rented a car, and a man named Don Hart, who was the facility manager, took Roger around and they inspected all these B-29s. And this one right here with the number three spray paint on it, that's Fifi. The reason they picked Fifi, they narrowed it down to five airplanes, then narrowed it down to three. And the reason they picked Fifi was it had the least broken glass because the rest of otherwise is pretty even. There was still a lot of stuff missing and needed a lot of work. So long story short, the CF made a deal for this airplane. Uh, a lot of people don't know that they actually made a deal for two airplanes and all the parts they could carry away. But they had no intentions of taking the second airplane. They just wanted to be, had the ability to take one. So they spent, you know, they spent, got, sent guys out there and, and had a guy named Jack Kern from Tucson, who was a maintenance uh, airplane restoration guy, rebuilder. And his specialty was taking planes out of the boneyard and that had been preserved and making him fly again. Fifi had been sitting here for 16 years and was not preserved. The windows were open, controls were unlocked, all that kind of stuff. So in, you know, the story is that it happened in nine weeks that they got the airplane flying in nine weeks. In reality, it took three months. 
but during that three months, there was nine weeks of work. So it was nine solid weeks of, of actual working on the airplane. The flight engineers panel, that's what it looked like when Roger took that picture. Um, it was all the instruments were gone or busted, and it was like that throughout the airplane. And they actually went to Davis Monthan Air Force Base in Tucson and made a deal and were able to go in. And there was a bunch of B-29s there that had been scrapped and a bunch of C-97s waiting to be scrapped. And that's where the majority of the instruments that were in Fifi came from, was they made three or four trips out there to, to, to get stuff out and, and save it for Fifi. And so in August of 1971, they got the airplane going and uh, took off and flew it six hours and 38 minutes and, and arrived in Harlingen. And uh, this is, that's uh, Randy Sohn, who unfortunately passed away last year, and then Roger Baker, and then Lefty Gardner, and then Daryl Scourge there on the right. They are the part of the flight crew that, that flew the airplane out of there. And uh, they've all passed away except Daryl. Daryl still lives down in Mexico and, and is obviously quite a bit older now, but he's the last guy left out of the, the original PP crew. And they're reading that map there, and uh, they had just gotten a pilot manual the night before. None of them had ever flown a B-29. And Randy Sohn has a pilot manual, and he has that, that map, and they're figuring out their plans. Well, then the nose tire popped. They were all standing there, and it just popped. And then so they had to wait. And that, there's a famous picture of them standing there with him with the folded up manual in his hand. That's why they were waiting for that nose tire to be, to be changed. If you look behind them to the left, you see a parachute laying on the side of that trailer. They all wore parachutes because they didn't put data. You know, they all knew B-29s during the war. It all caught on fire every time you turned around. And so they were scared to fly without parachutes on because they didn't know if they'd make it or not. So, but they flew it six hours and 38 minutes and, and wound up down in, in Harlingen. This, this is out of my collection right here. This is a photocopy of the sign. Well, the sign was hanging everywhere, but this photocopy, what I was told, was hanging on the door of headquarters because everybody was asking, where's the B-29? When's it coming in and all that? And this was hanging on the door down there. And uh, it wound up in a bunch of paperwork that I ended up getting. And I found it in there one day. So I, I think that's kind of neat to have that telling everybody that's coming. And uh, so that was in 1971, August of 71. And then that's the crew when they first landed. You see the A-26 with the long nose there in the back. That's the one that uh, ended up a gun runner. But that's in front of the fighter hangar there in Harlingen. And this was the last time the airplane flew until 1974. And uh, the, you know, the Air Force had a one-time flight clause. And uh, Vic Agather worked until 1974 to get that removed. And then finally, um, in October of 74, I guess it was, they finally got approval to fly it. And that, that's a, another cool story about how all that happened, but it's too long for this. But they flew the airplane again, and at the time it wasn't named. It, you know, the airplane didn't have a name. And uh, didn't have the big A on the tail fin or anything like that. At, at 1974, right before the air show, they, the, C, the general staff voted to name the airplane Fifi in honor of Vic Agatha's wife because Vic had bankrolled this entire thing and then paid the operational cost for several years of operation. And so it was named after Mrs. Agatha, and that's where the name Fifi came from on the nose. And that's, that's Vic Agatha and Mrs. Agatha standing underneath there the day the airplane was named. And then the big A on the tail fin was put on even after this. Uh, that was put on in San Angelo. And that was done, the A was for Agatha. And obviously the family still is very involved in the airplane today. And she's the, you know, the queen of the fleet and uh, my favorite airplane by far. Well, and uh, you should actually expound a little bit on, on Vic's history uh, in World War II because he was very involved with, with B-29s. Vic Agatha was a, uh, he was in the reserves, in the Air Army Reserves, and he got called up to active duty. Uh, right before his wedding, um, basically got leave to go get married and then disappeared. And he wound up getting pulled into the, the development team of the B-29. And he was kind of a liaison between the Army and Boeing, working for Brigadier General Eric Nielsen, who was the first man to fly around the world in a Douglas World Cruiser. Um, they worked directly for Hap Arnold, who was the chief of the Air Corps. And Hap Arnold gave them carte blanche to get the B-29 going. And so Vic Agatha was put in that as an engineering officer. And then when the airplanes went to Kansas to be all modified to the same standards, because they came off the, the flight, they came off the assembly line, uh, not all to the same standards because they were making changes as the airplanes were being built. So they take them to these modification centers and bring them all up to one standard. So they were all the same. 
Well, that was called the Battle of Kansas because all this happened in, in the worst winter they had had in Kansas in 30 years, all outside, no hangars to put the airplanes in and all that. And Vic was kind of the guy who ran that entire thing. And then he accompanied the airplanes to China. And then later he went to uh, to Japan or to, to uh, Tinian with them. And uh, he said on VJ Day, he thumbed his nose at the B-29 and said he never wanted to see one again. And he said he blamed all his health problems on the years he spent working on the B-29. But he said it kind of brands you. And for whatever reason, I could never get it out of my mind. And so when he joined the CAF, he was a very successful businessman. And he had the ability to, to fund this. And he did. And we owe a great deal of gratitude to Vic Agatha. And, you know, naming the hangar after him up there at, at the headquarters here in Dallas, uh, you know, the Vic Agatha hangar, that's a, a very well-deserved uh, honor. Because he did far more than just get us a B-29. But because of him, we have a B-29. Because of his family, we've still got one. So. Yeah, it is uh, an amazing story and and uh, a legacy that continues, as, as you mentioned, uh, oh, yeah. uh, even today. And uh, we're, we're going to spend more time uh, on uh, talking about Fifi. And it, it, as Brad and I were talking about, you know, this this presentation tonight, we realized that the 70s uh, really were a, 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 a like the 60s, a time of great expansion and lots of stories. So we're actually going to break the 70s into two pieces because there's there's just so much to cover. And it, it just is uh, amazing. The uh, the transformation of the organization in you know just a little over you know, a little less than fifteen years, and uh, this, this uh, aerial shot from Harlingen. Um, did you say this was nineteen seventy four? That that picture is nineteen seventy two, and you can you can tell that because all the airplanes are painted. This is right before Air Show seventy two. The airplanes are all painted in military colors. The Fifi doesn't have the A on the tail fin and doesn't have the name on. And so this is after she arrived and, and the real restoration work hadn't started yet. I mean, they'd done some to it, but it, it was being worked on on the ramp. And so this is what the CF fleet looked like, essentially, in, in 1972. And this is right before the air show. And then you can see right there behind it, that's the museum and the officers club and, and offices and all that. In 1975, towards the end of, you know, the part we're going to talk about, that's when the CF said, you know, we have partially because of Transfer 72's success, we've become so big that we have got to change the way we do business or we're gonna fall apart. They didn't have enough staff. They didn't have enough uh, money to do everything they needed to do. So they basically split the air show business off because at this point, the CF is paying to go do air shows. And they split the air show business off into kind of its own little department. They took over the officers club, closed the officers club down and turned that into office space. Then they later built another club, but they had to have, they didn't even have room for the ladies that worked there at the time to answer the mail, the immense amount of mail that came in. So they quit doing air shows just for gas only and started charging. They said, if we're going to take airplanes to shows, we're going to have to get reimbursed to do this. So that kind of started, I guess what you would call the modern CAF, the modern warbird world to where they found out that we can't do this on our own. We have to get other people to pay because we have gotten so big and so successful and at the time it was you know today it's re ridiculously expensive but at the time you have to think in 1975 you know that was crazy what it cost back then i remember they said back then spark plugs were six dollars a piece and they thought that was ridiculous well now some spark plugs are 70 dollars a piece you know so it just it, it's all relative i guess but mid 70 is when the cf really started operating like a like a business and some of the funds started disappearing out of necessity, which started its own problems, you know, that, that still go on in some manner today, you know, because some people think it ought to be more fun. Other people that are, you know, more dedicated to the business end say, yeah, it's fun, but we got to pay for it, you know. And so um, this 75 was kind of the end of the old CAF and the beginning of the new CAF in, in my mind. Well, and, and also uh, along with that, that business shift, you also have uh, in aviation, the warbird movement itself, you start to shift from, um, you just, and I, I'm trying to find the, the right words, not loosey goosey, but it was, it was a much more relaxed uh, atmosphere that, that uh, people flew in and even looking at maintenance. And as the warbird movement continued to, to evolve, maintenance, flight operations, uh, safety, all started to, to kind of push uh, some of that fun out. But uh, as as you mentioned with the business model as well, it's kind of necessary. Yeah. Well, and and you know, 
uh, Air Show 75, which happened in October of 75, was the biggest air show they'd ever had at that point. And that, that air show got written up in Air Classics magazine, which at the time was about the only aviation magazine. And I mean, it talked about, you know, how big the fleet was, how great the CF was, how they were the world leaders in this business, and they hoped other people followed, and how if you want to learn how to do it right, you need to follow the CF. And so Lloyd Nolan and the general staff and all those guys, they saw that attention was being placed on them. And a lot of this was because of Transpo 72 and that exposure that they got. By this time, 75, the, the museum was starting to form. You know, there was already a collection, but it was just stuff sitting around. In 75, they got the museum committee together and hired their first employees and all that. It really got serious. They said, we are a, I don't want to say a tourist destination, but a tourist destination that people come see CAF headquarters. And, you know, at the time we weren't doing nationwide tours. So all the airplanes were right there unless they were gone to air shows. So I was 75. I said, it, it's not where all the fun ended. I don't want it to sound like that. But that is when it became a business where they're like, we can't, this is no longer, you know, frustrated fighter pilots flying Bearcats and Mustangs out of a, out of a cotton field. This is a serious business and the world is looking at us. And uh, that, you know, that, that kind of starts a whole other story about how it went after. That's right. And they continue to look at us and look toward us uh, for for guidance and, uh, you know, the, the standards that uh, CAF has set. Yeah. You know, if you think about it, we, like I said, in 72, we had 55 airplanes. We have, what, 174 today? Something like that. I mean, I don't know how many members there were in 72 or 75, but it was, you know, 3,000, maybe, something like that. There wasn't that many people doing this. It just so happened that this time the world war ii veterans that flew these for real you know in 1970 those those guys were you know 50 years old and they some of them were successful and had been successful in the airline pilots and made a lot of money and all that and they were still putting their own money into this there, there's a guy named bill connell who put twenty two thousand dollars of his own money into the a20 havoc because nobody else really get it going and he wanted to fly the a20 again so he put twenty two thousand dollars into it Bob Griffin, who I talked about earlier, probably put seventy or eighty thousand dollars in over a couple of years, and it all culminated with here in the mid seventies, when now everyone's looking at you. It's no longer Cotton Patch Cowboys. It is a flying organization that is worldwide known. Well, a couple of uh, questions that have, have popped up on our uh, chat box. If if you have a question, uh, we've still got a couple of minutes. Go ahead and type that in there, and we'll uh, we'll see if we can stump Brad uh, tonight. Um, this one, uh, as a kid, I visited the CAF headquarters in uh, Harlingen in the mid '70s. I remember at least five P-47s in a hangar in various states of restoration. Whatever happened to those airplanes? And the viewers said, I'm assuming they were purchased in Central America. Those airplanes. Um... Peru, I think, is where they came from. I can't remember exactly, but yes, uh, Central or South South America, actually, Central South Central America, wherever. I don't know where the line is anymore. Uh, those airplanes were purchased by a guy named Ed Juris, and he brought them up to the CF because he was a CF member, and and he knew that only the CF could really get all these things put back together and flown. And they put them together. They got two flying. In fact, one of them went to Transpo seventy two. The CF had a Thunderbolt at this time, but it was an end model, the one they still have today, and it was in the process of restoration. They ended up getting all six of those flying. And there's a famous photo that Bill Crump actually took. It was one of Bill Crump's very first uh, photo missions in an airplane um, of all six of those Thunderbolts stacked up and flying. And uh, But they never belonged to the CAF, and they all ended up getting piecemealed out one at a time because they had, you know, a jurist had to pay for them. And uh, I think all but one of them is still around today. I think one of them was destroyed, but the rest of them are still around and most of them are still flying. The one in the Kalamazoo Air Zoo today is one of those airplanes and it doesn't fly, but I think for the most part, the rest of them still do. Um, another question, uh, were there any other groups uh, that were represented at Transpo 72? And uh, I don't believe there were so. groups. There were, there were uh, you know, small air show acts like uh, you know, I think Bill Fornoff and Corky Fornoff flew their Bearcat and Mustang, or, or the, both Bearcats there, as I recall. Maybe the Bearcat and the Mustang. Um, there were uh, famous performers. You know, Bob Hoover was there. I think he flew the Bronco, the OB-10 Bronco, and uh, he flew the Mustang, and he might have flown the T-28 routine. I don't remember. 
Howie Keefe, who uh, back then owned the P-51 Miss America, he flew in the air show. You know, he was a race pilot. And he set a, a world speed record going from, I want to say, California to D.C. And he arrived during the air show as this big Guinness, Guinness record being set. And he flew in the show. So, yeah, there, there were other, you know, one-offs that, that flew. Uh, the Thunderbirds, the Blue Angels. I, I think the, the British Red Arrows might have been there as well. But as far as Warbirds, there really were no other groups that operated the way the CF did. So we were the only large Warbird group. There were a couple of other, you know, one and two ships. But for the most part, the warbirds were represented by us. Yeah, and and again, uh, as you as you mentioned, Transpo seventy two was more than just an air show. I mean, it was all aspects of transportation uh, represented uh, in in that uh, in the the festival. It's a shame it didn't continue to happen because it probably would have wound up being the Paris Air Show here in the states. But but it it, it never did, unfortunately, and uh, it's just the way it goes. But uh, I think the CF would be a lot different today if Transpo 72 had it never happened. We might not have been as well known at the time that we were well known. And that really happened at a critical point in this business. So right. we're lucky it happened and lucky we're able to do it. Uh, one question that I think is going to take us out of the 70s is, uh, are there any um, uh, jets that are in the uh, CAF fleet? Jets? Um, we have a T-33. Uh, we had an F-86 for a while, but no longer do. Um, you know, for years and years, the intent was just World War II airplanes, and then it kind of expanded out into Korea and Vietnam. The problem with jets is there's there's just not that many that you can get. There's a lot fewer jets available than people think, unless you want to get into the Russian stuff. But uh, and they're so expensive to operate. But back in the early, I guess the mid '70s, maybe late '70s, the CF did have an F-86 that was donated to them. And they're like, we cannot afford to do this. We can't, you can't dump gas out of a bucket any faster than you can burn it in the F-86. And so they flew it a couple of times and ended up selling it to Leroy Penhall out in California. And I think the airplane's still around, but the CF didn't own it very long. We had a lot of airplanes and maybe that'd be a subject for another show sometime is the airplanes that were given to us that we quickly got rid of. Um, Cause there was a lot of airplanes that I could find my list. I'm like, wow, I didn't ever know we owned that. But we've just never had many jets and as far as I know, Flying wise, that T thirty three is the only thing we still have. Yeah, I believe so. And and again, you're you're talking uh, the the maintenance costs uh, alone uh, are just astronomical when it when it comes to the jets. And uh, right. you, you know, some of the civilian owners that that have them today, um, they have one, and that's it. I know there was the um, down in Texas, there was a, a museum at at one time that had classic jets. Uh, there, and yeah, the combat and jets. Flying. Combat jets. Yeah, they donated. And, they donated a guy named Jim Robinson owned all that. And he donated everything to the EAA because of the, the cost of it and, and family issues where I guess grandma had the money and didn't and wasn't going to let him have any if he kept flying jets is <laughs> what I was always told. So in order to get his inheritance, he had to put the play toys away. You know, one of the great things about the Warbird movement and, and aviation in general is there there are some really great stories out there. And, and uh, it certainly... Uh, Thank you for uh, sharing some of those with us tonight, Brad. And and we'll uh, we'll we'll pick this up in in another couple of weeks and uh, take a look at the back half of the 1970s and uh, okay. uh, see what uh, see what the CIF was up to from about 75 and, until 79. So, again, uh, thank you for joining us for another CIF Warbird Tube webinar. If you have suggestions for uh, any future topics or someone you think we should uh, talk to, please uh, drop Leah Block uh, an email at uh, media at cafhq.org. And we'll be back next Wednesday night with another edition of the CIF Warbird Tube webinar. And, uh, again, thanks to Brad Pilgrim for joining us tonight. I'm Steve Buss. Have a good night.